recording this. Thank you. Um, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, those joining us from afar. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to have a very good friend join us today, Bruno Scheller, uh, to talk about drug gold balloons. And for those of you who don't know Bruno as intimately as I do, I, Bruno really is the father of drug coated balloons as far as I'm concerned. Everything I've ever learned about drug coated balloons I've learned from, from Bruno Scheller. Uh, and he did all the first studies, um, all the preclinical work um, with a large team, but you know, really pioneered uh, this field. And the fact that we have drug coated balloons today uh, is thanks to a lot of the work that Bruno did initially many years ago. So Bruno, I mean, us and our faculty, we're really honored to, that you can take some time uh, out of your schedule to spend an hour with us. Thank you. Thank you, Alcim. It's a great, great honor and pleasure for me to, to be allowed to, to contribute to your famous, famous session every week. <laughs> I think this is very unique. This is a worldwide uh, um, uh, event which, which nobody has. <laughs> so, it's a great honor. <laughs> so um, I'm happy to, to give you some, some update on truck coated balloons coronary, which, is, which are not yet approved in the U US, as you know. And I want to uh, look a little bit at the differences between Paclitaxel and, and serolimus as, as, uh, for coating. Uh, here you can see again uh, the, the timeline of, of the interventions. And, and we started the, the first in men trial coronary end of 2003. And we started at this time um, with coronary instant resinosis, was by metal sand instant resinosis at this time, because there, there was no real option for uh, in 2003 to treat this, this disease. Um, what is the, the current state of coronary DCB worldwide? And this gives, gives you a little bit the, the, the distribution worldwide. So we have countries like the United States where there is no uh, coronary DCB approved at all. So this is zero use. Um, we have uh, Europe where we have an acceptable penetration. So the, the DCB to DES ratio in the PCI procedures all over Europe is about one to 25. Um, and Germany is 1 to 15. Um, and then we have Asia, where we have a much better penetration already. Asia Pacific overall is uh, 1 to 10. This means um, in, in 1 um, of 10 DES, there's the use of DCB. It's not per patient, it's, it's, it's per, per, per lesion, this, this ratio. And the biggest users uh, are located in Japan. Um, they have 20 to 10, 25% uh, penetration of DCB in coronary procedures, which is uh, a really high penetration. In the US, um, I think there is, there is an unmet need. The first unmet need is uh, treatment of instant resinosis. In the US, uh, uh, still more than 10% of our PCI procedures are related to, to ISR treatment. Um, and so I think there, there is... Is all, also in the DS there, there's some interest and some, some need to, to introduce DCB. Uh, what are the, the limitating factors of DCB use? Uh, there are diff, diff, uh, multiple factors playing a role. It, it has to do with the, the training. We Most of us are trained in, in stand procedures, learning how to stand, not how to do angioplasty today. And one of the other uh, objections we have is uh, objections to Paclitaxel created especially by the uh, Katsanos meta-analysis, uh, but also uh, based on the history of drug looting stands. And I want to go shortly back to the history of TES. Today, uh, drug looting stands are, are the default tool to treat coronary artery disease, but this was not always the case. If you, the older ones may remember the so-called ESC firestorm in 2006, uh, where two meta analysis uh, claimed that uh, drug looting stents would increase deaths, similar to, to what later happened with uh, Paclitaxel peripheral DCP in the Katsanos analysis. On, and interestingly, in, in this analysis by, by Eduardo Carmen Sint, uh, which played a major role in this ESC firestorm, um, it was not the, the Paclitaxel looting stent which created. Uh, uh, the noise, it was the serolimus eluting stand. So it was not always clear that Paclitaxel is bad 
ancient and Sirolimus is the good one. In, in these early days, it's, it was the opposite. Things changed when uh, people looked at the randomized trials comparing Pactitaxel eluting stand, the Taxo stand, and the Cypher stand, Sirolimus eluting stand. Here, there was a significant difference in, in, in MACE in favor of the Sirolimus eluting stand, and this created uh, the, the victory of the Limus agent in the, uh, in the uh, stand area. However, if you look a little bit more careful on longer follow up, the same patient population, the difference was created uh, in uh, TLR rates uh, within the first year. And after that, uh, the, the curves uh, did not uh, further separate. And if you look at uh, DEF um, or myocardial infarction, there was no difference at all between Pactitaxel and, and Sorolimus and Lutic stents. Then later on, other trials said, okay, Everolimus is better than Zerolimus um, because they compared the newer generation Everolimus eluting stand with the older generation uh, Zerolimus uh, eluting stand. And then meanwhile, we have also newer generation Zerolimus eluting stand and suddenly there's no difference anymore between Everolimus and Zerolimus. So um, then the newest information is we have uh, Everolimus may be worse than Everolimus because if you compare a thin strut uh, uh, permanent stand with a six strut uh, absorbable stand, then you have a, a significant difference in maze. So uh, what I want to say is that this, this belief that, that limus agents on stands are superior to Pactitaxel on stands has a lot to do with the history of the stands and a lot to do that this early generation taxo stand was a sick uh, 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 strut stand and the polymer used there was uh, uh, not, not the best polymer you can use and they had issues with coating technology and so on. So um, therefore this, this belief that for DCB, Limus may be better than Pactitaxel is based on, uh, in my opinion, not totally correct interpretation of the history of stands. So why, why is there uh, maybe room for, for DCB in the treatment of coronary artery disease because we have also with newer generation packaging stand uh, device related event rate in the range between two and four percent per year and uh, as far as we know this this event rate does not stop at least uh, with the follow-up time we have for example five years. So now Pactitaxel, why Pactitaxel? Because the short and a true answer is we had it on shelf in our lab and had no serolimus on shelf. Um, the more uh, complex answer is that there was uh, some work in the 90s, uh, um, for example, in Germany, in, in the group from uh, Karl Karsch in Tübingen, uh, Christian Herdeck as co-workers, and they uh, looked at local drug delivery non-stand based for restless prevention, and they used uh, different tools, double, double balloons, uh, porous balloons, and all this stuff. And they uh, did a lot of work with Pactitaxel and showed that there's a biological effect uh, if you do local uh, drug delivery. Um, for me, uh, the opener for Pactitaxel was a presentation I attended at TCT 1999 in Washington. Um, this was my first travel to, uh, to a, a meeting outside Germany at this time. And I attended a presentation by Dr. Heldman at this time, and he presented preclinical data, um, uh, porcine data on Pactitaxel limiting stands. And uh, this was very impressive because they very elegantly showed that the more truck you use, the more uh, suppression of the intimal area you have. So this, this, this was very impressive at this time. And I met um, Professor Ulrich Speck. He was at, was at this time head of contrast media research at Sharing. Um, and he developed, for example, gadolinium and, and uh, in the uh, X-ray area, this was this iopromide. And we talked about ideas how to improve or how to change the properties of contrast media. And the idea was that we may combine the contrast medium with Pactitaxel. And interestingly, we found that the contrast medium was an excellent uh, uh, tool to uh, dilute the, uh, the Pactitaxel, whereas if you uh, try to solve it in ethanol, uh, this was almost impossible in, in higher concentrations, but with, 
with this contrast medium, it, it was the perfect solvent. Um, and the idea was that sometimes you see the staining of the contrast medium in the coronary artery after the injection. The idea was to, to use this contrast medium as a carrier for the paclitaxel. And we did some cell culture experiments and found that if we do a short exposure of the cells, of the smooth muscle cells through this formulation, uh, then the cells had a very limited growth over a longer uh, period of time. And the, the contact time was only a few minutes. Uh, up to one hour or only three minutes, and we had this, this, this longer lasting effect in the cell culture. Um, then we had um, the information from this, this elegant experience from uh, experiments from Elaza Edelman's lab that uh, Pactetaxel has some specific tissue binding uh, in arteries. This was where perfusion experiments in, in calf uh, um, uh, carotid arteries. And there was an up to 100 fold higher concentration found in, in, in this artery of Bactetaxel compared to a uh, pure diffusion. So, so this was uh, very specific. However, there was also the inf information that if you have, for example, proteins in the, in the solution, this binding is, is, uh, not, is not present. Uh, what we did, we uh, uh, um, used a porcelain coronary stent model, bare metal stents with overstretch implanted. And uh, we implanted them with, with a conventional contrast medium or with an iopromide protoxyl. This is a, um, a very similar to, to Pactitaxel um, formulation and injected it. And we found a different significant difference in neo intimate information at four weeks. So this was very astonishing. Then we repeated this experiment now with a Pactitaxel formulation, two different concentrations. And we found again a dose dependent reduction of neo intimate information when injecting. Pactitaxel with the contrast medium. Um, these are uh, uh, PK uh, studies, again, in the porcine model. Also, uh, it's means drug transfer to the vessel wall. And here, this is the, the Taxol formulation, which is used for, for cancer therapy, direct injection in the coronary arteries. And this is the uh, formulation with the um, contrast medium. And we found that we have a much better tissue uptake um, in the vessel wall when combining the pactotaxel with this contrast medium. So at this time, this was in, in the year 2001, we had the information from the uh, preclinical DS trials that with permanent stent with, with controlled drug delivery, you have uh, a biological effect in, in terms of reduction of knee intimal formation. We knew from our experiments that if um, you inject contrast media, um, you have also an effect. And so, uh, but the, the issue with the contrast agent was that you have no control what is the dose in which area of, of your vasculature. And therefore, we were looking for a more lesion specific approach. And so the idea came up to coat a balloon with this contrast medium pactitaxel formulation. And these were the first, one of the first prototypes. These were samples for the clinical trials we did this, this time. And in a first animal experiments, again, Porcine coronary stent model overstretch the metal stent implantation for weeks uh, follow up time. Um, the amount of new intimal formation was almost the same between uncoated balloons, uh, balloon coated with pure pactitaxel. Um, however, the combination of the pactitaxel with the contrast medium led to a dose dependent reduction of new intimal formation. So, this was the, the first animal proof in animals that this concept of DCB may work. Uh, what we learned uh, was that um, the mechanism of action is in persistence of the drug in the vessel wall. And this is, for example, data for the uh, Pactitaxi urea formulation for the, for the Medtronic uh, impact uh, balloons. And here you can see that we have, even after six months in the porcine model, we have therapeutic uh, tissue levels um, of this drug. And this explains why we have a longer, longer uh, clinical effect efficacy and why there are differences between different DCB because not all DCB have this persistence of the drug in the vessel. So what about the clinical safety and the efficacy of Pactitaxel? I won't not show all the data, only a, short, only a few, a few uh, samples. Um, number one, instant restenosis in Europe and Asia is an accepted indication for coronary DCB plus 1A recommendation at the same recommendation level like the use of a second drug eluting stand for the treatment of instant restenosis. This is supported by a large number of randomized trials, not big ones, but, 
but here we have a patient level meta analyst the, the data loss um, trial um, putting all these this studies together com comparing DCB versus DES and DES approach for the treatment of DES restenosis and as you can see hard clinical endpoints over three years are not significantly different however the event rates are lower with the DCB approach, pachytaxel uh, coated balloon versus the trichologic stand approach. Um, vice versa, the uh, reduction in TLR is better with the stand and stand approach overall in these trials, about 30% uh, more repeated TLR with DCB versus stand and stand. And this has to do that the stand does the mechanical work additionally whereas the balloon only delivers the truck and you have to be much more um, uh, empathic for, for your lesion preparation. This is very elegantly shown by, by um, Asim a few years ago. Uh, they looked at, at Milan at the repeated target lesion reversalization in ISR treatment, depending on the, qual on the result of the lesion preparation and the adequate or acceptable result includes a TB3 flow, a residual stenosis of up to 30% and no fluid limiting dissections. And if you do not reach um, <clears throat> those parameters, then you have significantly higher uh, repeated re-stenosis rate. This is newer work from Japan. They, they looked at the, the same um, uh, question and they uh, defined additional parameters, total inflation time, um, the um, uh, DCB to stand ratio in, in diameter. And um, they define not the 30%, they as cut off for the uh, residual diameter stimulus, they uh, define the 20%. And if you do this, all if you observe all these, these things, you have better outcomes. <clears throat> and this is the basis for the recommendation of the for the DCB only strategy. Um, lesion preparation, independent if you do treatment of ISR or de novo disease. Lesion preparation is the most important step. Um, and uh, you should reach some uh, quality criterions, which are non-flow limiting dissections, type A and B are fine, but, but not C or higher. A residual stenosis of up to 30%, maybe up to 20% would be better. And if you um, need additional information or have a type C dissection, then you can do additional functional measurement and maybe decide then if you use DCB for local truck delivery or you implant a, um, a current generation packet would extend. So this is the concept. And when following this concept, uh, then you can identify the lesions at risk and stand them. And those uh, that are not at risk can be treated with DCB only. And here from this car register, you see that the acute and subacute vessel closure rate is extremely low with, with DCB only. It's even lower in this, this analysis than with current, current generation track to extent. So this is a really safe procedure if you follow this concept. Um, from the randomized data, I want to show you only two trials uh, in small coronary small vessel disease, the novo disease. The first randomized trial was again from Asim's group, the Bello trial. Um, at this time, comparing the taxo stand with the um, impact Falcon um, DCB in small vessel disease, uh, 163 patients overall. And the interesting thing was the three year follow ups that has been shown. There was a significant um, benefit in, in MACE in favor of the DCB approach. And you can see the, the events occur within the first year, mainly TLR. And then the, the curve is relatively uh, flat with the um, DCB approach, where, whereas you have further events with the, uh, with the DS approach. Uh, bigger data set has been published uh, by our group. Um, now the basket small two trials, 758 patients with uh, de novo disease, smaller than three millimeter uh, in diameter. And here we see against current generation faculty extent in terms of maze, um, almost the same event rates up, up to three years. Uh, interesting finding from Basket Small uh, is that if you, if you look at an angiographic subpopulation, that we have not seen any thrombotic occlusions in the, uh, in the DCB arm, but a relevant number of um, uh, stent thrombosis. And I think this is very important. If you do not implant a stent, you have no risk for stent thrombosis. Um, I want to skip this now. Um, Another important question for the safety, especially when discussing uh, 
or when looking at the Katsanos meta analysis, uh, was the question how safe is it to use paclitaxel coated balloons in coronary artery disease? This is a meta analysis we uh, did together with, with the, the authors uh, or PIs of the, of the randomized trials, main, major randomized trials. Uh, 4,590 patient, uh, patients enrolled in 26 trials. And here we found against an alternative treatment, which were, was predominantly stent treatment, uh, that we have less myocardial infarction within the first year. And after three years, we see uh, some signs of lower mortality with paclitaxel coated blues, not higher mortality as in the Katsanos analysis. Here for the coronaries, we see a lower mortality. So the, now I will show you some examples and data for an effect we call late lumen enlargement, which is very important for DCB treatment. Why? Because if you stand the vessel, you have the additional radial force of the stand and have additional lumen gain uh, created by the stand. If you do balloon-based approach, you will always, or in almost all cases, have a worse initial result compared to a stand treatment your initial lumen gain is lower than the stand. Um, and therefore to uh, have be on the longer term um, comparable to a stand, you need some kind of positive vessel remodeling, vascular restoration or however you call it. And we call it late lumen enlargement. These are some examples here, this lesion in the circumflex artery, 2.516 paclitaxel coated balloon, this one sigma please. This is the acute result, okay, but not stent like. After five months here, you can see where the balloon was, the lumen has increased. Um, here, here, a small uh, female um, patient with this lesion, and here, a really small uh, uh, LED, a 2.0, 20 uh, sequence, please. This is the initial result, not stent like. At 15 months here, the lumen has improved. This is a bifurcation case um, here. Um, Predilatation, carina shift, uh, 3.0 DCB in one direction, 3.0 in the other direction. Um, and this is the, the final result, which is again, not stent-like with this, this dissection. And at six months, uh, we see this very nice result. So this is what we see. Another example from a, a trifurcation case um, three DCB uh, in all three directions, sequentially used. Um, this is the initial result of some dissection, but it's more flow limiting. And this is um, a little bit more than one year follow up. And again, you can see this increase in lumen bandwidth. And um, we looked systematically at this in a, in a, a series of patients. Um, and what you can see here in the MLD distribution, pre-treatment, post-treatment, and then we have a shift uh, from the left to the right um, at follow up. And this is unique for, for DCB only treatment in the absence um, of, a, of a stent. This finding has been confirmed by other groups. Uh, here, this is work from, from uh, South Korea. Uh, um, on what, what they find in an IVIS study is that this increase in lumen area uh, is accompanied by an increase in vessel area. Um, Furthermore, we have newer data from Japan saying that in part of the lesions, you have this increase in total vessel area leading to an increase in, 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 in lumen. But in some cases, they see also um, some kind of plaque regression, which is uh, really exciting. So we are, the concept now is that we have some kind of imitation of the Klagoff effect. So this is this compensatory uh, um, increase in total vessel area induced by Paclitaxel, at least, we know this for Paclitaxel. Um, and in some cases, there may also be some kind of plaque regression. Um, and the key question is the main question is is this really a Paclitaxel specific effect, or do we have this effect also um, with serologies? So, when most of the presentations that are given about serologies coated balloons say Paclitaxel is cytotoxic, Serolimus is cytostatic. This is not true. It is true for the first few hours, 
of your DCB application, but no longer. This, um, this uh, statement that Paclitaxel is cytotoxic is, is based on, uh, on this paper from, from the Munich group. They looked in the cell culture uh, at indicators of cytotoxic toxicity and apoptosis for Paclitaxel and Sirolimus. And what they found is that indeed for Sirolimus, um, cytotoxicity is relatively stable with increase in, in concentration. The same applies for apoptosis. And for Paclitaxel, we ha you have a dose-dependent de effect on cytotoxicity and apoptosis. Cytotoxicity with Paclitaxel starts with a concentrations of 50 nanogram um, per uh, milligram. You, it is true that if you look at the drug distribution with drug eluting stent, you have this concentration for Paclitaxel eluting stent in the area of the stent struts because the, the distribution of the drug is, is completely inhomogeneous by a stent based approach. So this means, yes, for Paclitaxel eluting stent, there is cytotoxicity around the stent struts. But if you look at the DCB, which has a completely homogeneous distribution and not this, these peaks in, in, in specific areas, then if you look at this publication comparing different uh, peripheral Paclitaxel coated balloons, within the first hours, you reach this tissue level of, of 50 nanogram per milligram, which creates toxicity. That's, that's true. But if you look at one day, at seven days, or over longer term, you are well in this area, and this is not cytotoxicity because you have the same level as serolimus. So cytotoxicity is a short effect within the first few hours, but it, it's not long term of Paclitaxel coated balloons. The next um, claim there is about when comparing Paclitaxel with serolimus coated balloons in presentations is serolimus has, has a wider therapeutic window. Um, it depends how you define a therapeutic window. Right? If you define it in, in the, the, the normal ways a therapeutic window is defined, this means uh, what, what is the, the highest level where I have no toxic effect, no, no, no severe side effect, um, and what is my, uh, my therapeutic dose. Um, then for Paclitaxel, we know that systemic treatment, one-time uh, systemic treatment uh, for cancer uh, therapy, which is okay tolerated. So this is 100 to 175 milligram per uh, square meter uh, body surface, so roughly 300 milligram. Um, for Zerolimus, um, Bruno, we can't hear you suddenly. There's kind of like music coming out from you, yeah, from your no, side. Uh, not from my computer. <laughs> now it's oh. over, now it's over. Okay, I don't know. good. I don't know. But now you can hear me again. You sound great. Perfect. Yeah, Thank perfect. you. Okay, okay. Serolimus daily oral dose, um, two milligram. This has been published by Ron Waxman. He used Serolimus uh, orally for, for restenosis prevention. Um, five milligram per day was not well tolerated. Two milligram was well, well tolerated. If you look what you have on, on one balloon, if a coronary DCB paclitaxel with three microgram is 0.4 milligram, that is 3.020. Uh, in peripheral artery disease for 5080, it's about 5.5 milligrams. Um, the serolimus balloons available are between one to four microgram per square millimeter balloon surface. This means 2.0.2 to 0.6 milligram uh, per balloon uh, for coronary artery disease, 1.6 to 6 milligram for peripheral artery disease. This is 0.4 versus 300. This is 0.6 versus 2. So after this definition, the therapeutic window is much bigger with Paclitaxel and not with Sorolimus. So the, the, next, the next important uh, thing we have to discuss when comparing Paclitaxel and Sorolimus is the way of binding into the cells and how they uh, block the cell cycle. Paclitaxel, um, has an irreversible binding to the microtubes. This means if the Paclitaxel cell is in the cell, the cell is blocked, it does not um, proliferate anymore. For Limus, we have uh, a reversible binding uh, via the mTOR receptor complex. So this means 
that you have to guarantee if you use limus on a balloon, you have to guarantee tissue levels that are therapeutic over a longer period of time because you, because you have a reversible binding. And the next question when comparing these two is the distribution in the vessel world. This is again uh, data from Elisa Edelman's group. Um, with Xerolimus, you have very even distribution in all parts of the, of the vessel, whereas with Pachytaxel, you have accumulation in adventitia. And this may explain why we have this growth in, in total vessel area, this, uh, this uh, positive remodeling we see. Another problem with Limus is that you have, uh, if you have not specific measures, you have a, a limited drug transfer compared to a Pachytaxel. And, um, uh, about two years, uh, 10 years ago, there was a program by, by Abbott where we contributed and Juan's group contributed, uh, where we're looking at the Sotoronimus coated balloon. It worked in the animal model quite, quite, quite good, but they realized that the total amount of truck they have to put on the balloon for a peripheral balloon uh, is in the area of uh, systemic treatment. And, and this was, was the, the point where they said, okay, we, we do not follow this path any, anymore. And this supports uh, the claim that the therapeutic windows with Pachytaxel is higher and not, not with, uh, with Limus. Um, meanwhile, we have different concepts for Zeronimus um, eluting balloons. Uh, one is the uh, virtue uh, concept. This is not a classical DCB, it's a, it's a porous balloon. Um, they have a, a specific uh, formulation, nano encapsulated Zeronimus formulation. And this is the key data in animals where uh, we have a good initial drug transfer and some um, uh, respectable tissue levels over time. There is one um, non-randomized prospective trial, 50 patients um, uh, for instant restenosis treatment. Um, binary restenosis rate um, in the per protocol uh, cohort, which was 36 patients, uh, very good. 3% uh, restenosis rate, later on loss of 1.2. Um, the other concept, the next concept is the magic touch. Um, as a uh, coated balloon, um, here is the tissue concentration. Uh, the Q transfer is fine. However, at uh, 14 days, it's, uh, most of the drug has, has gone. So far, we have no randomized data on this balloon. And the um, third available serolimus concept is the, the solution um, DCB. Uh, here we have data from a peripheral non-randomized trial with, with very good um, data, but so far we are waiting for, for randomized trials, um, especially in the coronary arteries. Um, the, the concept uh, I'm involved in is, the, is a highly crystalline um, coating. Um, with a uh, four microgram per square millimeter balloon surface, we did um, an extensive research program with different formulations and, and we were focused on, on crystal modifications. And we found finally that with the with amorphous uh, formulations, uh, drug transfer is not that good and uh, drug persistence in the vessel wall is also not that perfect. However, we found that with such a highly crystalline uh, uh, formulation. We have a um, truck transfer very similar to what we have seen with Paclitaxel. And uh, we have uh, at four weeks uh, almost 50% of the truck still in the, in the vessel wall, which was fulfills this uh, criterion for Cerolimus to have uh, the, the longer persistence in the tissue uh, due to the reversible binding. So this is uh, restenosis, I can skip this. And this compares to the different approaches, uh, acute transfer here for the, for the different concepts, which is published. If you put them all in 100% and look at four weeks, then we have with this highly crystalline uh, coating, we have the, the best uh, persistence. The first uh, randomized data uh, from the Malaysian ISR trial have been published uh, two years ago. It's for 50 patients randomized to this uh, highly crystalline serolimus uh, uh, coated balloons or to the uh, sequent please Pactitaxel uh, coated balloon. And what we found here were uh, very similar uh, 
late loom loss uh, uh, of um, in segment of 0.21 with the uh, signal please and 0.17 with the zero volume screw treatment. So this looked very, very uh, promising. And what we did uh, in addition was that we uh, repeated the same trial again in Germany and Switzerland, again with 50 patients. Um, and it was uh, pre specified that we can combine those, those two trials uh, for a combined analysis. And uh, uh, this has been presented at TCT um, this year. So this is the, uh, the data of the whole population. And this is the uh, QCA data average lesion, lesion lengths of 13.8 millimeter reference diameter relatively small of 2.6. Um, and um, at six months uh, follow-up angiography um, repeated ISR was um, uh, seven cases in the Pactitaxel group and four cases in the Zerolimus coated balloon. And uh, here, if we look at the primary endpoint, late loom loss um, in, lesion and in segment, uh, they were again very similar in this extended population, 0.26 for the serolimus coated balloon, 0.25 for the pactitaxel coated balloons, and here is the late loss distribution, which is very similar between the two groups. So I think um, in a caged vessel, um, it seems that serolimus may be in the right formulation equally effective to uh, pactitaxel, um, coated balloon at least up to um, six months angiographically. Clinical outcome was also uh, very similar. Uh, furthermore, at TCT, we had two uh, new trials on de novo disease uh, with Lymus balloon. The first one was uh, the BioRise China trial, um, comparing a biolimus coated balloon with uh, POBA in small coronary artery disease. Um, in 10 centers uh, in China. And uh, this primary endpoint was uh, also late loom loss at nine months. And there was a significant uh, difference between the biolimus coated balloon with a late loom loss of 0.16 and the uncoated balloon angioplasty of 0.30. Um, so the uh, primary endpoint was reached uh, and this balloon is superior to POBA. Um, if you look here now at late loom enlargement, where, uh, which I showed you the data for Pachytaxel, where we see this in about two thirds of all cases here, we had for the biolimus balloon, we had it in about 30% of cases. However, significantly more frequent than it was the case with POBA in this, this population. Uh, this is now the full uh, data set of the QCA analysis. And again, positive remodeling, 30% versus 10%. The second de novo trial uh, was the Malaysian de novo trial, which had um, a similar design as the ISR trial I, I presented to you. Um, in this trial, 70 patients were randomized either to the highly crystalline uh, serolimus coated balloon, the 4 microcompass millimeter balloon surface, or the uh, sequent please. And those patients underwent angiographic follow-up at twelve months and clinical at six months and clinical follow-up at twelve months. Um, this is the uh, part of the baseline uh, data. About half of the patients had acute coronary syndromes. Half of the patients had diabetes in both groups. Um, Lesion preparation was mandatory as in all these trials. Um, uh, scoring balloons were used uh, frequently in, in both groups. Um, and um, final dissections uh, were rare, almost type A and B, which are fine according to the consensus group recommendations. Um, the uh, lesion length was relatively long, uh, uh, about 25 millimeter, reference diameter more predominantly small vessels, 2.8, 2.7 uh, millimeter on average. Um, and the uh, final result was very similar in both groups, uh, both with about two millimeter at the end of the procedure. Um, the primary endpoint here again was late loom loss uh, and the non-inferiority margin uh, was uh, not, not reached. So, so this means the uh, serolimus coated balloon was non-inferior to the pachytaxel coated balloon in the novo disease in this trial. 
However, if you look at the late loom loss distribution, we can see that there is some difference. We have more uh, negative late loom loss in the paclitaxel coated uh, balloon group than it is the case uh, with the Zeronimus coated balloon group. And uh, if we look at the MLD distribution again, we, we see this shift from the left to the right with the paclitaxel coated balloon. And vice versa, here in this area, shift from the right to the left with the uh, serolimus coated balloon. And uh, here we had this negative late loom loss uh, in 58% of the lesions in the paclitaxel coated balloons, which is similar to the other trials and data we have, and 32% uh, in the serolimus coated balloon groups, which is very similar to the uh, results of the um, Bio Rice China trial I, I showed you before. So um, in segment late loom loss, by the way, was 0.1 for the Zeroim's coated balloon and close to zero for the Paclitaxel coated balloon. So my final conclusion is that at this time, Paclitaxel coated balloons remain the standard for um, uh, truck coated balloon uh, because we have a much bigger data set and we have it. it looks still like the perfect truck for, for this one-time truck delivery due to its irreversible binding. Uh, there's no class effect. There are differences between the different types, of course. Uh, and the clinical evidence is by far the, the biggest so far. Zeronimus uh, coated balloons uh, are technically more challenging because there's a reversible binding to the mTOR receptor complex that requires a long persistence of the truck and vessel wall. Um, we do not yet know what is the optimal excipient coating procedure, dose and retention time. And we have very limited published clinical data. So, so far only one RCT is published still in a small one. And therefore I think we are in the beginning of, of, of a new technology and, and have to define it, its role in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. That was uh, a really complete and thorough overview of the science behind Rakota balloons and, and the differences between Serolimus and Bacrodaxel. I have a couple of questions, but I would prefer um, some, you know, the fellows first to start uh, with their questions. So these are many of our interventional fellows who are joining us here, and you can see. Uh, so we'll just. <laughs> Um, so we'll just go around. Maybe we'll start based on my screen. I see Samina on top. So Samina, why don't we start with you? Good morning. Thank you so much for the great talk and uh, the opportunity to, uh, and your time. I have a few questions. Uh, one of my first question is that, you know, the mechanism of instant stenosis is, uh, uh, you know, biological or mechanical. So um, all these trials that you discussed, my question is, was there any inclusion criteria that we must use coronary imaging before including these patients? Um, because we're not addressing the mechanical, um, uh, you know, ideology, if that's a reason for ISR. Mm. Uh, very, good, very good and important question. The majority of these trials did not uh, use additional uh, intravascular imaging and, and did not specifically identify the, the, uh, the mechanism of, of ISR. That, that is, of course, that's a limitation. Um, and another limitation is that these trials were con conducted at different time points and in the beginning, uh, most of the trials did not systematically do lesion preparation. This was, was the case in, in, in later, later trials. Then. And this is another limitation. And um, the, the, if you do not uh, imaging, then you should in every case do high pressure, non-compliant pre-dilatation, uh, guarantee full stand expansion, independent of the question if you use additional imaging on it. And this was not the case in many of the trials. Um, I fully agree that one could do this much better. Yeah, I think for many of the trials, and compared to what we're doing now, the, the randomization point was at the beginning of the case, rather than after lesion preparation, which is kind of what we're doing now in many of the clinical trials. Um, Samina, was there another question? Yes, uh, so another question I had, I have two more questions. One is, is the use of DCP in, in vulnerable plaques. Now that we have this uh, technology with 
so many different modalities. We, we can now recognize vulnerable plaques that they are not obstructive, um, but we know that these patients are at risk for ACS. Um, is there any any thoughts of using DCBs in those lesions in the future? Mm. Uh, that, that's uh, that's very fascinating to, to think about it. There is there's one trial in preparation in the Netherlands, to my knowledge, uh, focusing on this vulnerable plaques and, and using DCB for uh, for seeding the plaque or, or whatever. Um, we we are thinking about um, different types. We, we have, for example, one balloon, uh, which we published already, which is a, um, a soft balloon. This is a balloon that, that uh, does not um, uh, dilate your, your artery. It, it only modulates to, to, the, to the vessel wall, only for truck delivery, but not creating any injury. Um, and the idea is now we have a program ongoing where we look at different trucks, maybe combination trucks, statins, um, limes, what, whatever in combination, uh, hoping that we may uh, have better tools to stabilize uh, such, such plaques. So this is a fa fascinating area, but in the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Samina. Um, Andrea? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this talk. Um, you presented the interesting data, especially the last trial on denovolution. So I wanted to ask you why you excluded restenosis and if you expect from a pathophysiological point of view, uh, different results in terms of drugs used. Mm. So, so we, 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 uh, we separated the, the, the two indications, instant restenosis and, and, and the novo. The uh, ISR trial, uh, uh, was was the first of the three uh, trials I, I presented. So, and in this, in the, in the instant restenosis trial, we found a very similar efficacy of paclitaxel and, and serolimus. And for, for me, whereas we had in the NOVA the, the, the NOVA trials, we have seen that in paclitaxel we have more frequently this uh, lumen enlargement or negative late lumen loss uh, compared to the to the limus drugs. Um, so for me, this means we have two mechanisms of action. Number one is uh, suppression of neo intimal formation, formation, which is where, where the ISR model is the perfect model because you have a defined tube by the, by the stand, which is there, and you look predominantly on, on neo intimal formation. And here we see a very similar behavior in this, this first small trials. Um, in de novo, it's different because we have also, in, we have in addition the question how um, um, behaves the total vessel over time. Um, do we have remodeling or not? Do we have positive remodeling? Do we have negative remodeling? And here, there seems to be difference between Pachytaxel and Limus. But, but this is small first data, and, and so far this is all conclusive, but we, we need a lot of more information on this to have a final judgment, I think. Thank you. Jesse? Uh, thank you, Dr. Scheller, for an excellent talk. Very hypothesis generating, and I think I have like 30 questions for you, but uh, I think I'll try to pick the, I think what I think are the most significant ones. Um, the first question is, in terms of, uh, you know, we live in a, in a world now where standard of care is intravascular imaging. Mm. And one of the advantages with stent placement over balloon pit placement is that we can assess our optimal results with apposition, making sure that the stent's fully expanded. What parameters do we look at with intravascular imaging to confirm that we've really achieved an optimal result? especially if there's going to be small dissections that we might not have seen angiographically or, you know, not fully expanded calcified areas. Mm. Um, number one, I agree that uh, additional imaging is very helpful and very good, but I think, I don't know what, what was your experience in Milan, but in all over Europe, the use of additional imaging is not that, that wide, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I must admit, if you look at, the use of imaging for Europe right now, intracoronary imaging, Jesse, you'd be shocked to know it's about 8% for the whole mm -hmm. of Europe. Uh, in Milano, it was a little bit higher because we were a big imaging center. But, you know, the, Bruno, the reason our fellows asked, because here at Monte, we do imaging 80% of cases. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very, because we want the fellows to learn 
how to do it. And because we still see a lot of, you know, restenosis and stent under expansion in our population. Yeah, especially because it's a it's a large population with very calcified lesions uh, mm. and complex lesions. So, you know, as we, I, I think the question is a good question, I, you know, and maybe we can both share our experiences is as we, in a center like ours, where we like imaging, you know, in in the restenosis group, I can understand where the imaging can be very useful because it's going to tell you about stent expansion and did you correct it. But do you have any thoughts, Bruno, in like de novo lesions? Uh, can imaging be useful or do you think rather FFR or IFR physiology is better? Mm. Um, I think in the no, for, for ISR, I think it's very helpful imaging on, and and. If, if you have reimbursement and can do it, you should do it. So, that's, yeah. you know, in Europe, it's, it's not, not the case. In Asia, it's also not the case. For de novo, I'm not sure. Um, because for de novo lesions, you have to accept a not perfect result. And the mechanism of angioplasty is one of the, the mechanisms of angioplasty is creating the sections. Right. So this, this means... Um, the, this means if you do additional imaging after balloon angioplasty, if it's only with proba or if it's with scoring balloon, whatever, you will see always an unperfect result and you will see dissections that you do not see uh, in angiography. And this will lead to a very high crossover rate for stenting. The, the beauty of DCB is that you are allowed to have an unperfect initial result and you gain over time and for this imaging is not helpful in my opinion <laughs> i agree and i think you know oct is probably like the worst to do after you can yeah. do the dcb only case because you'll you'll see so many dissections right i mean one of the challenging things jesse and to the other fellows that when we get DCBs available and we start using them in de novo is the mindset change of the fact that, you know what, it's okay to leave a non-flow limiting dissection, okay? Whereas now when you see it, oh, just stick another stent in, okay? Right. And that mindset change is actually very difficult, I gotta tell you. Um, it's something that people like me and Bruno, when we lecture and we, we've been trying doing this for years, trying to convince people that it's okay. Uh, that if you, you know, if it's not flow limiting and there's not lots of staining and you see a little dissection, you could leave it, it's gonna be okay. And you're not gonna get acute vessel closure is kind of a battle we still fight and trying to convince our colleagues, but in our own practice, we see it all the time. Right, I think that's what's great about what you're bringing to our attention is that it's, it's really, it could be a, a real paradigm shift, not only in, in how we treat patients, but what we're doing in the lab and how we're thinking about it. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, of, of course. It, it, is, it is not replacing a, a stand with DCB. It's, it's, it's a different treatment strategy. And you start with, with lesion preparation. And when you start, you're completely open how this procedure will end. You right. do not know if you will put a stand or, or use only a DCB for local tract delivery. And that's a completely different strategy, I think. And that's not, not easy to convince people, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> We've been trying for years. But again, to, to your question, um, um, I, I agree with Asim, uh, um, uh, FFR or, or maybe pressure wire, as Antonio suggests, uh, mm. is, is really helpful, especially if you are not sure if you can leave this dissection or not. For A and B dissections, I think it's, it's okay. You, I, don't, I do not use FFR, mm -hmm. but if I have a type C uh, dissection where not every type C dissection is the same. And there are some that are dangerous for, for vessel closure and there are some that, that are totally benign. And I think uh, functional measurement, measurements can help you a lot to, to decide what, what type of, of uh, type C dissection you have there. Right. And I think we're also going to see a lot more of these hybrid approaches of, you know, like Bruno says, you go into the case, it's diffuse disease, you, you, you're not sure what you're going to use, you have both these technologies available, but in the end, having the drug coated balloon may allow you to limit your stent length, you know, 
I think it's fascinating when you see someone like Antonio Colombo, who taught us how to do full metal jackets, actually, you know, say now that he never wants to ever do one again. Okay. And that he, that he'll never do a full metal jacket ever again. And that he himself feels bad about how many stents we will sometimes put into patients. And so he's now trying to limit the amount of metal he puts into a single artery by using the combination of black coated balloons and de novo disease. Um, Mikos, we'll move on. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for your uh, great talk. I enjoyed seeing how you moved from uh, bands to uh, clinical practice, your data. Um, one question I have uh, is about the uh, CAV population. So people with uh, coronary allograft vasculopathy, those transplanted patients uh, that they have uh, uh, neointimal formation, and that's the mechanism actually that uh, uh, is leading to the vessel occlusion or microvascular disease. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're giving systemically mTOR inhibitors. It's a very difficult to treat disease and it's a quite, uh, you know, it's it's a decent sized population um, in the transplant community. Do you envision any studies happening with drug coding balloon in this population? That was my, my first question. Then I yeah. had a question about the calcified lesions. Mm. Um, um, very good question. We discuss this often. Um, the, the the problem in Europe is that we have we have not that many patients anymore which uh, have transplant vascular parties because we have there there are no organs available and and we have now more LVAD and, and so on and so we did some cases some underwent drug eluting stents some underwent DCB treatment we had the impression that they went a little bit better with, with DCB treatment but it's a high risk population and the, this device can't, can't improve the, the underlying disease and, and so, so that's it makes sense of course but I think it will be hard to show benefit in, in, in a randomized setting. I think, you know, um, Bruno, you're in, you're in New York and Monty, where we work, we, this year we'll have done 50 heart transplants by the end of the year. Uh, so we have more organs available. Um, and we get asked as the interventional group to study a lot of these patients with allograft vasculopathy. And I got to tell you, I mean, the rapidity, the way they, of when they get vasculopathy of how they progress and, you know, the drug eluting stents don't do so great. I mean, we've had so many restenoses in progression that I, I'm, I'm going to be fascinated to when we have drug coated balloons. I think because we have to study this more, but you need volume. So, you know, this yeah. is something that maybe like in New York or in a couple of centers in the U.S. where there's still a lot of transplants happening. It's something that's worth studying um, because if we can, you know, avoid putting lots of metal into these patients, it may, I think it could be. Uh, a better strategy but we need to prove it of course mm. and then my second had to do with the calcified lesions mm. um do you think that um uh, do you do you have any data about the drug penetration in those calcified lesions do you think uh, by including patients with severely calcified lesions uh, mm. um, that uh, you know they need a atherectomy or um, other uh, modification calcium modification techniques do you think that they kind of dilute the effect of the studies or should we treat them equally in the studies or when we study them to the other people that they don't have uh, heavily calcified lesions? Mm. So, so what we know, especially from the, from the peripheral artery disease, that if you have a circumferential calcification, uh, you have, it's extremely difficult to get a truck in the, in the, in the deeper vessel wall. Um, so the, it, it's, the, but, but you, you have also limitations if you put a stent in because you have incomplete uh, uh, stent expansion. Um, the, 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 the important thing is to have to get rid of the calcium first. And then, and then you decide, and, and then it, it's, it's almost the same. Then you decide if, if you need a stent or you can use a DCP. Um, Franz Kleber, a, a good colleague of mine in Germany who, who does also a lot of, of DCB de novo disease um, has a, a, a series now with lithotripsy um, uh, plus DCB and he's totally enthusiastic because he says to, if you get rid of the calcium by, by, the, by the ultrasound uh, then you have again a vessel which is flexible and everything and then you can have, have great, great results but um, at the end of the day uh, you have to get rid of the calcium independent if you stand on DCP. Thank you. Bob, uh, any questions from you? 
Yes, uh, thank you so much for your talk. I'm always moving during these talks, so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna sit down. But uh, my first question is regarding um, saphenous vein graft. You know, vein graft have shown that have more restenosis, more aggressive, difficult to size, mm -hmm. and poor mm -hmm. outcomes. You mm -hmm. know, in these patients who start to have these issues, you know, I know there have been some small studies that have shown no. No significant difference, but from, you know, I want to know your thoughts on DCB's utility um, in vein grafts. That's my mm -hmm. first question. Mm -hmm. And obviously my second question, just a generic question about diabetics. There was a good paper that came out in TCT um, last trial about this amphetaline eluting stents and showing some benefits. And even Basket 2 had almost 60% patients who mm. were diabetics. So mm. really when these diabetics with high A1C come, I mean, is this almost a class 1A to kind of think about this reach for a DCB in a diabetic with an A1C of 10? Of course, you want to control the A1C. But how aggressive do you think, you know, when we eventually get it approved, do you think we should be in um, uh, uncontrolled diabetic instead of trying to put a drug eluting stent uh, in those patients? Thank you. Okay. And number one, uh, SVG. My first an answer is try to reopen the, the native vessel and keep away from <laughs> SVG. <laughs> so, so my, 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 I, I, I can answer you if, if there's benefit of DCB. I, my, our strategy is jump and run. If we have to, to treat the, the SVG, this means uh, do as less as possible with, with this SVG. <laughs> And this is not not a not a friend of DCB because with DCB we want to do a lesion preparation, do it do it well, and, and this means several inflations. Therefore, I cannot really recommend DCB for SVG. Um, for diabetics, it makes sense, of course, because it's long in most cases long diffuse disease. This uh, would require small long stents if you treat it with stents. And um, I think this is, is uh, the perfect scenario for DCB to, uh, to reduce your amount of stents. At the end of the day, as I seen said, you will end up in a hybrid procedure. This means you, you predilate all, the, all this, uh, these long lesions and, and look how the result is. And then you have areas where you say, okay, I have to, to put a short stand there. And longer areas where you say, okay, this looks okay. And then I can use the DCB for local truck delivery. And I think that that's, that's the big benefit of this technolo technology. Y you will always need stents, that, that's, that's for sure. But, but you can limit the length and number of stents. Um, Bruno, this last question, we have a couple of questions from me from the chat and so on. Um, one of the colleagues asked, you know, um, the terminology has changed a lot. Before we used to talk mm. about drug eluting balloons when we first mm. started. Now we call them drug coated balloons. Maybe if you could just comment on what the correct terminology is. Oh, the, the, the story is very simple. You, you know, we had at, at um, we, we, we did in our first publications, so some were mistaken with DEB, but in most of the publications we said drug coated balloon because we have the drug on it and give it away. It's, it's not an illusion. We have a short contact and it's gone. Okay. Therefore, we said coated. And then came, uh, I think it was B. Brown because they were the, we were the first then to, to try to, to bring a coronal DCB to the market. And they said, ah, oh, we have drug eluting stents and we said drug eluting balloon. And then we had in parallel these two, uh, nom uh, these two names. Uh, and I always said, okay, but it's a truck coated balloon, it's not a truck coated And uh, so, so it came and, and over time, most of the population uh, publications said coated and, and now it's had shifted again to coated. That, right. that's, that's from my point of view, the whole story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bruno, maybe this is the last question. Um, you know, this whole Cyrilimus Paclitaxel debate for drug coated balloons. I, it gets a little bit confusing at times in a sense that, I mean, you look at the data for paclitaxel in coronaries, I'm going to concentrate on coronaries where the data is clearer. The data is very good. Uh, we have excellent, amazing long-term data. Mm -hmm. And you've also now shown with some of the randomized data, we also have positive remodeling, which we may be, which is probably more impressive than with serolimus and which we know has been an effect of paclitaxel even with stents. Um, I mean, do you think this whole serolimus coated balloon is just another one of those um, fashions, you know, fads, 
because of some of the concerns with Packley Texel in the periphery, or do you think it's here to stay? Um, to be honest, I don't know. Um, the reason, you know that we, we are also working, doing a lot of work at the moment with, with serolimus coated balloons. And the reason why we are doing this is because um, I, I feel that um, we have too many objections by interventional cardiologists against Paclitaxel. And, and I try to try to show from my point of view why this is the reason, and I don't think uh, it is real. I, 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 in my opinion, Paclitaxel is the perfect uh, drug for, for tricotic blue. But if we want to get more, uh, if we want to convince um, the, the intervention community, we have a little bit to follow what what they say, and, and they, they say, okay, we know in the stands we have flyers, this is good, why not on the balloons? Um, th this is the motivation why, why the companies uh, are working on it, and because they believe they can get a bigger a bigger market share if they have Seronimus on the balloon than, than with Pakitaxel. Scientifically, I do not think that, that this is re really an, a step forward. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of my feeling too. Uh, it may just it, it may allow wider adoption, but mm. I'm not really sure. I mean, if anything, we're ever going to see better than we're seeing with Paclitaxel. Um, Bruno, thank you so much. This was a fantastic hour. It flew by. I think we all learned so much uh, from you. Uh, and thank you very much for taking and spending an hour with me, the fellows, and everybody else who joined. Stay well and happy holidays, my friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. And thank you for, for all your questions and your